there's virtually an unlimited amount of possible bugs in any smart contract system. And of course, given the fact that many smart contracts will hold value directly, pay almost anything to make sure that these bugs do not exist in your contract. So that's why in this video, I'm going to break down 21 very sneaky bugs that I see come up again and again in countless smart contracts, just from things that I've personally seen in actual audits that we've done, or I've seen come up again and again in contest reports, private audit reports, and so on. Some of these are somewhat niche findings. Others of them will apply to literally any code base, but regardless, you'll want to know what each of these are so you can proactively avoid them in your smart contracts or look out for them when you're doing an audit. But of course, why should you care about the 21 most common tricky bugs that I see? Well, first of all, my name is Owen and over a year and a half ago, I founded Guardian Audits. And ever since then, we uncovered dozens and dozens of critical and high vulnerabilities and bugs exactly like this in over a hundred different smart contracts. And my goal with every video that I put out and especially this one today is to essentially help you become a much, much better blockchain engineer or security auditor as quickly as possible while avoiding all of the mistakes that I personally made along the way. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and get into 21 sneaky smart contract bugs. All right, guys, we have many, many bugs to get through today. We have 21 different bugs that we're going to look at. And for each one, we're basically just going to run through, talk about, you know, what are some scenarios in which this can come up? And I'll even show some examples for some of these to help sort of explicate exactly what each bug is and how it essentially leads developers to shoot themselves in the foot. And of course, if you have personally been gotten by one of these bugs before, go ahead and leave a comment in the comment section below. I know that myself personally have fallen prey to a few of these distinct bugs before I was into smart contract auditing and when I was actually developing and building our own protocol, then uh, certainly a few of the, these bugs have caused us to have blunders. With all that out of the way, first of all, let's dive in to the 21 ways here. So the first bug here is going to be that when you delete structs that sort of encapsulate mappings or lists inside of them, then it actually doesn't delete the the values inside of that mapping or list. So essentially the stuff that you know points to data elsewhere, it is not recursively deleted when you go ahead and delete the top level struct. See. So if we go into remix here, we can actually see that we have an example here to sort of lay it all out exactly what I'm talking about here. We have an object struct which inside of it holds a mapping, right? So, you know, just an arbitrary mapping, ID to ID, whatever. And then we have a objects mapping here. So what I can do is I have, you know, just some basic functions to set object. So to, to set the value in this mapping for whatever particular object, and then you can read it correspondingly. And then of course you can delete it. So we have a nice little CRUD smart contract here. And essentially you would think that if I delete this object and then I go ahead and I read from this object after deleting it, then I'm just gonna read zero, right? The default value after it's been deleted. However, if I go here and we literally set object to four and then I read the object, okay, cool, we get four. Now, if I set it to two and then we read it, it changes to two. Of course, you would expect that if I'm going to now delete the object, right? So I'm deleting the object that was at of X of one. So this should be deleted. Now, when I read it, we actually see that it is still two. So this mapping here is, you know, still existing with these values. It doesn't recursively go and delete all of, you know, this entire mapping here. Okay, fantastic. So the second bug here is actually has to do with a contract upgrade. So when you're upgrading a smart contract and you have 
immutable variables, those immutable variables are actually not translated to the upgraded contract. So why is this? This is of course because immutable variables are stored in the actual contract code on the, the execution of the constructor when they're first assigned. So of course, if they're stored in the bytecode, you get some gas optimization from that. But on the other hand, if you're upgrading, then of course you're not going to get that bytecode that references those values in the upgraded version of the smart contract because this value is not in storage. Okay, and then number three is of course going to be the classic subtractions that underflow and revert. Now this is of course really dependent on the logic and the application logic surrounding the subtraction, but any particular flaw in the logic that surrounds a particular subtraction can lead to a potential DOS attack where, you know, any function that somebody tries to call actually ends up reverting because they are attempting ultimately to subtract something that is larger from something that is smaller and making a uint underflow. And so really something to just focus on is each subtraction call, everything, every even a, a minus equals call, something like this. These are all things to pay attention to and make sure that in all cases, if it is going to underflow and revert, is that expected, is that fine? Or are there potential cases where it would end up underflow reverting and that would cause a DOS attack on, on something that should be possible. Okay, and then number four here, of course, since we have you know newer versions of Solidity that actually revert with a panic code instead of you know underflowing or overflowing, you would think that we are now safe from underflow and overflow and that you could ignore it. But actually, underflow and overflow is still possible in certain cases, like when you're downcasting. So if I'm downcasting a uint256 variable to a uint8 variable, it is very, very possible that whatever stored in that uint256 variable could overflow the uint8. And actually that overflow will not revert. You'll have to use a library like SafeCast from Open Zeppelin if you want that downcasting to revert rather than overflow which you probably do. Okay, number five here is a super, super basic one, but you would not believe the amount of times that we see this actually happen in legitimate audits, in legit contracts, and sadly, even probably in contracts that end up getting deployed. And so this is just having a withdraw method for contracts that are intended to receive ether. On the other hand, or adding simply a receive method to contracts that are intended to receive ether. So the either of these is, you know, for whatever reason, often left out. And, you know, perhaps you think by default, like, oh yeah, you don't even consider that a contract can't receive ether. So you don't even consider adding the receive or fallback function. On the other hand, the function for withdrawing ether, I don't know how, but we continually see functions that contracts that have a receive function but actually don't have any way to withdraw that ether that was received so of course this would be a very very bad day if you realized that you deployed your contract it had amassed you know 100 ether or something like this and there was no way to retrieve it so absolutely this is something to keep in mind especially as you're building contracts that expect to receive ether is to always, 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 always have a way to withdraw the ether from that contract. Number six here is having parallel data structures. So this is something in all types of software that usually ends up leading to some sort of bug ultimately, but it can be critically, critically damaging in a smart contract. So one example of this is actually something that got me very early on when I was originally developing a, a small optimizer vault protocol in Solidity. And essentially what we had is we had a list of struct objects and each struct object basically stood for somebody's request to withdraw in the next epoch, right? So there's some complex stuff going on with staking periods and things like this, but essentially we had an array of structs and then the critical mistake that we made and a poor design decision on our part was to have 
a separate mapping which stored all of these. And so you could go from ID to one of these withdrawal request structs, and then the struct on it would actually have essentially a, a index that would point to where it is in the list. So of course, this ended up being an extremely poor design decision because one of the ways that we were updating the list when we were popping people off of the list, we did not actually account for somebody else moving in the list. And so what we did explicitly when we were popping somebody from the list is we took the person who was at the last index of the list and we moved them into the position of the current person who is being removed from the list. Now that's great, the accounting's fine for the person being removed from the list, but that person who got popped off from the end and moved to the position where the current user was, we never accounted for the updating of that person's index that was stored in the mapping. So parallel data structures, almost always a bad idea, almost always lead to critical bugs like this, where the, the impact was actually that people would not be able to withdraw if their index was not updated properly. So if you ever have parallel data structures or you find yourself in some sort of similar, you know, data structure arrangement, where if, if it even sounds similar to what we're doing, reconsider it, there has to be a better way. Okay, and the number seven here is, of course, typos. Now, it sounds very basic, but I cannot tell you the amount of just plain critical bugs that we have found that are literally just arising from typos. So oftentimes it absolutely pays to literally just do a last pass over everything, read everything line by line, be very meticulous about it, and pay attention to the details as opposed to thinking of just the high level and the high level attack surface and things like this. Number eight here is actually having to do with a little bit of low level Yule. If you use the mstore Yule command, you should absolutely be wary of the fact that this does not update the free memory pointer. And so this means that if you expect to read the free memory pointer slot later, and get an accurate free memory pointer, then you would be wrong. The free memory pointer would not be updated to give you the latest word that has free memory. And especially if you have normal solidity code after an assembly block that uses mStore, then that solidity code is probably going to be overwriting whatever memory you actually stored in the assembly block. Number nine here is using transfer or send. And this is of course a pretty common one, but also in the near term right now, if you use transfer and send, there's a good amount of multi-sig wallets and smart contract wallets that you're actually going to be completely incompatible with because they actually consume more than 2300 gas in their receive function. Okay, number 10 here is of course just division symbols, right? Division symbols are a bug always and they should never be used. Oh, of course, I'm just kidding. You can use division symbols, but of course you need to be wary of precision loss and divide by zero reverts. These are two of the most common classes of vulnerabilities, especially precision loss, since Solidity does truncation. In many cases, precision loss is just exactly the knob that an attacker needs, or just exactly the thing that will end up yielding what is basically a critical bug in the application. So it's important to investigate every single division symbol and consider both of these cases of either precision loss or divide by zero revert and considering the impacts of each and making sure that if there is any precision loss that it is completely trivial and fine and it doesn't affect the application in any way. Okay, number 11 here is handling units wrong. So this can be anything from treating every token as if it has 18 decibels, not considering a difference in the number of decimals per token to even applying extra precision to a variable when it already has that precision or it doesn't need it or forgetting to divide by a certain precision amount when you already multiply by a precision amount. A great example of this is any kind of per share calculation. You'll see a lot of these, but sometimes you'll store like a magnified per share value 
And a lot of times you'll actually see that a very common bug is that in some subset of functions, it's actually completely forgotten about to divide by the, the magnification to get that number back down. Okay, number 12 here is of course, assuming that every contract can accept ether or every address can accept ether. So of course, if you're sending ether to an address and this is a function that absolutely needs to go through, hopefully you're not doing anything in a loop or anything like this, but of course that address can DOS attack by basically just not being able to receive ether. And this doesn't even have to be malicious, right? There are plenty of contracts and addresses that just don't accept ether by default. And it's important to note that this also can apply to ERC20 tokens in the event that an address is blacklisted. Okay, number 13 here is actually loading in the return value of .call, right? So basically just using .call straight up. Now this is not necessarily a bug per se, but it can lead to a very interesting attack vector, which is gas griefing. Now, if you have a keeper executing a transaction or something like this, and in that transaction, you are dot calling an arbitrary address, that address can return as a part of the return data, an enormous amount of return data that ends up getting copied into memory as a byproduct of just using the call function. And so this memory copy is going to be extensively expensive, especially if it's an enormous amount of data, as memory gets exponentially more expensive as you have that expansion cost. So this is just simply like a gas griefing attack vector to consider. And the solution is of course to use a low level call in Yule or something like this to avoid automatically loading the return data into memory. All right, number 14 is using for loops to push instead of pull. So of course, this is one of the, the earlier things that you will probably learn as you're developing smart contracts and designing systems that need to ultimately get a bunch of tokens to a bunch of addresses out of the system. It is always better to let those people individually come and claim their rewards than it is to have some logic to push it to each of those individual addresses in something like a for loop. And this is number one, of course, because it's, you know, just something that uses an indeterminate amount of gas cost, right? If I had a function that iterated over an entire uh, list of addresses or something like this, then if I, as an attacker, or even just by way of using the product normally, add a bunch of addresses to that list, it could actually cause that function to require more gas to execute than there is in the block gas limit. And so essentially that would make the function unexecutable and whoever was expecting to receive funds that way would have essentially experienced a complete loss of assets. And like we just discussed, you could have addresses that return a ton of data to be copied into memory to even further make the, the gas costs too consumptuous so almost always using for loops to push tokens or ether to some address is almost always a bad idea. Okay, number 15 here is using message.value in a loop. I actually saw this in a single case before where Open Zeppelin did, they did a full audit on a protocol and then what the protocol did is they went and they changed their code after the audit and they introduced this bug where ultimately, you know, layered in a bunch of different functions and stuff like this, you could actually have a specific function that you call that ended up using the message.value inside of a for loop. And so of course, when you use the message.value inside of a for loop, 99% of the time, more often than not, you're going to be duplicating the value of message.value, right? Because message.value is not going to change as you're going throughout the for loop. So if I iterate five times and I credit you with sending me message.value each time, I'm going to basically credit you with five times the message.value. So if I sent you one ether, you're going to think that I sent you five ether. And of course, this is a critical, critical bug. So absolutely never, ever, ever use message.value in a loop. And of course, just a note on something similar is, you know, 
accepting an amount parameter while also going off of message.value in the body of the function. So there's nothing explicitly wrong about just that, but it is very much like a code smell that something probably could go wrong and it, it's just unnecessary. So always look out and try to see if you know that could be resolved and actually just remove the amount parameter. Number 16 here is about decoding an arbitrary bytes data that came from an untrusted address. And you can see more about what I mean exactly here if you see my intro to Yule video where we actually went through and picked apart a very, very cool Yule exploit that used Yule to create an exploit when somebody was decoding an arbitrary bytes revert. And so almost always, if you get some arbitrary bytes, oftentimes it can be dangerous to just even use those bytes, right? You don't know what those bytes look like at a low level, what they are doing to manipulate the system into thinking whatever it is. Almost always, it's going to be extremely dangerous to try to do stuff with arbitrary bytes, especially decoding them as they can be, you know, fooled into thinking, like in the example that we have in that video, that there is an enormously long string that they need to parse when in fact there is no such string. Okay, number 17 is, of course, the use of transaction.origin as authentication. So, this is something that's commonly flagged by Slither, but it's just important to note that transaction.origin should never be used for authentication as if a user interacts with any smart contract, then that smart contract can call into your system and basically pretend to be the user because the user here is still the transaction.origin. And so this is essentially like a Web3 phishing attack or something like this. Okay, number 18 here is of course, correctly validating the price result of an Oracle price feed. So specifically for something like Chainlink, it is always, always recommended to check if the price answer is from a recent timestamp. So there's a heartbeat that's configured for each aggregator and the price should be updated at least since the last Heartbeat. So of course, if your application detects that for whatever reason the, the Oracle is down or out of date, then there should be some sort of fallback Oracle or some mechanism in place to limit the scope of any potential arbitrage or anything that can occur because of this. And it's also worth noting that if you're building on a, a layer two like Arbitrum or something like this, that you'll need to check if the sequencer is down because if the Arbitrum sequencer is down, then of course prices are also apt to be out of date. And number 19, here's everybody's favorite fee on transfer tokens or also rebasing tokens, tokens that just change balance on transfer. They ruin almost every system they're an absolute headache and it's just something to consider. Most people try to just rule them out for their system entirely and ignore the headache. But when you're building particular systems that have like trustless deployment of new markets or pools or anything like this, then you almost have to consider fee on transfer tokens. Of course, you need to implement the appropriate balance checks to assure the system that it's actually receiving the amount that it's accounting for. Okay, and then number 20 here is perhaps one of the most common bugs that actually is more dependent on the application specific logic, but is rather like a class of bugs that can be found you know, throughout almost every code base, not even in solidity. And that is of course the off by one error. So here I've actually got a very, very nice example here from Rare Skills and they actually have an example where you can stake and unstake, right? So simple enough, and they have an array of stakers. But then now in this send rewards function, we can imagine what send rewards does. It sends rewards to the player. It divides the total rewards since last claim by the stakers.length. But of course, what we've done just before this is we have removed the message.sender from the array. And so exactly what we've done here is we've decremented the length of this array by one before we have actually sent rewards using the the accounting for having that, that many stakers before we were removed 
to decide how much tokens should be rewarded to the sender. And so this particular class of bugs shows up in so, so many different ways throughout whatever code base you're currently working on or looking at. And it's always just something to be paying attention to and keeping a close eye on every line of logic here. Okay, number 21 here is of course, chain compatibility with your smart contract. For example, if you're going to be deploying the same smart contracts across many different chains, of course, there are some considerations for each chain that you're deploying on. For example, some chains, the wrapped native token will use use dot transfer which has a limited amount of gas while on others it uses a dot call with unlimited gas some wrap native tokens on specifically like arbitrum have you know extra functions that add additional utility like withdraw to which allows you to withdraw from arbitrum wrapped ether and send it to an address directly without having to withdraw and then send it in two separate calls. But of course, these functions do not exist on every single wrap native token. And of course, you'll have to consider if you have any sort of hard coded addresses in your contract, those of course need to be updated. And then on top of that, you need to consider different block times. And if it's on an L2, you need to consider using like something like an ArbSys contract to read the actual block number that's accurate to the L2 and things like this, right? So just to name a few, there are many, many considerations when you're deploying on a new chain and your contract should be evaluated specifically for each chain that they're going to be deployed on. All right, fantastic. Those were 21 tricky bugs that often come up in many, many different smart contract systems and can have critical impacts. I hope you learned a few new classes of bugs and hopefully this can help you to avoid these in the future. If there's any new ones that you had no idea existed or maybe you just encountered recently, go ahead and leave a comment below and let me know which one was the coolest, the most rare. And then of course, if you are working on a protocol or your team is ready to release some sick DeFi project or you're just coming up and getting ready to release and you're looking for a smart contract security audit before you release, then go and get an absolutely free first pass security notes from me personally, just a quick review of the contracts to give you anything that you might want to look out for, some general feedback on the design from a security perspective, and also get a quote for a smart contract audit of the system when you go to guardianaudits.com slash quote. And of course, if you know anybody who's currently building out a really cool DeFi protocol and they need to get it secured, then send them to guardianaudits.com slash quote. Now, of course, if you're looking for a community where you can learn more about Web3 security and really brush up on your skills and connect with others who are interested in becoming a top tier security auditor or even just increasing their security blockchain knowledge in general. And if you're even interested in teaming up with others across the world to compete in team audits of real code bases and get a real feel for what it looks like to audit as a team and work together and learn from others, learn from their experiences and craft your own team report, put your name on it and then be able to show it to the world. If that sounds like something you'd like to do, then go check out lab.guardianaudits.com and submit an application to join our growing community of auditors. All right, fantastic. That is everything for this video. I can't wait to see you in the next one.